everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. We are right at the end of year of 2021. Well, that doesn't mean that our classes are going to stop. We, I'm going to, you know, still keep on going in January and we'll talk about upcoming things near the end. But for those of us who are sticking around for this uh, last online class of the year, I thought it was a good time to discuss budget conscious yard care because some of us may have um, you know overspent over the holidays and now the weather has been so beautiful um, you're looking at the yard out there and wondering oh there's all these things I'd like to do I'd like my yard to look really nice um, but guess what I just don't have a lot of money with which to do it so we're just going to talk about Things you can do in your yard, we're going to start with things that you don't have to spend any money for, and that will make a big difference, and um, then other ways with low-cost um, landscape care. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities. I work for the water department that many of you um, are customers of ours, not all of you, um, but many of you are, and my program is Florida Friendly Landscaping. This program was developed by the University of Florida and I work very closely with Hernando County Extension. But again, my paycheck comes from <laughs> Hernando County Utilities. Um, as I work um, in, uh, in a department in this, um, within this department, it's huge, water conservation. There are two of us in this department. And I concentrate on water conservation, mainly um, outdoors. And if you have any questions, like I said, I, I shut a lot of your communication abilities down to protect us all because I was concerned with um, all the attention this class got. That's usually, I've learned during these Zoom classes that can be an indicator of um, people wishing to uh, commit shenanigans. So if you have any questions or anything, um, you can always email me. It's lilyb at hernandocounty.us. You see those uh, Facebook memes that go around where people complain that, you know, my email's right there in front of you and you still spell my name wrong. There's two L's in the middle of my name. <laughs> you won't be able to email me um, if you don't use those two L's, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. Okay. Let's see. Um, we move on. Again, here are the nine principles and we're gonna cover a whole lot of them. When I first started hearing about this program, it was about um, early 2000s, right around the year 2000. I worked at County Extension um, as uh, in a clerical, um, position way back then. I started in 1999. And so in the year 2000, we started hearing about this program that UF developed. We, uh, it was called Florida Yards and Neighborhoods at the time. Since then, um, they took three different programs under the same umbrella of Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, if you can Google either of those terms and find out a lot of information, Florida Friendly Landscaping, Florida Yards and Neighborhoods. I would stick with Florida friendly landscaping because we have used that term probably for a good 10 years now. Um, but when I first heard about it and read these nine principles, I was like, that's what those of us who don't have a lot of money and who don't like to do a tremendous amount of work have been doing all along. <laughs> so that's kind of what we're going to be covering all of them today. And since, um, I found myself thinking of, you know, how do we, how do I talk about no cost or low cost yard care? I kept automatically drifting back to everything my mother did. Um, so I'm dedicating this particular class to my mother. Um, and here is, you know, here's why um, I know, I know I have a listener today uh, from Masaryk Town. Here's a picture from Masaryk Town, Florida. She lived in a itsy bitsy, teeny tiny little, 
humble home, let's put it that way. And um, looks worse now since she uh, hasn't been in it since 1999. Um, and it went through flooding and anyway, and no, I'm not gonna tell you where, where it is. Um, <laughs> It's too embarrassing, but the way she kept it, look at these azaleas, you know, all around this humble abode. Um, this is one of my sisters, you know, visiting her. So this was in February or March and just how she, she always kept her home. You know, you can tell she made an attempt to make it homey and did her, her versions of decorations, you know, a lot of crocheting, all that kind of thing. But outside is where she shined. I mean, she was just a fairy out in the yard and always could take the most humble of abodes and make them look beautiful. Um, I was, um, she had me late in life. It's what you call a menopausal surprise. So therefore I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with her, you know, in the second half of her life. Um, in which she was really able to spend a lot of time outdoors and in the two houses that I lived in with her in Pittsburgh and then here in Massaric Town, Florida, just watch the magic she could do. And she had little, you know, very little funds with which to do it. So I'm always going to be um, falling back on the things I knew that um, she did. So here we go. This is dedicated to my Massaric Town mama. There we go. So let's talk about the things you can do right now, walking outside your door and not spending a dime, the no cost yard improvement. <coughs> Here's a, you know, you, a given you think, well, that's pretty easy, but I know, I know that I tend to um, like stack stuff up, you know, put things in piles, um, on my porch or wherever, and you get so used to seeing it there that you're not paying much attention that it looks like clutter, just even things. So what you could do is pretend one of two things, pretend you're getting ready to sell or pretend you have some company coming over that you know you, you care about what you know, everything looks like and you're really, maybe you're gonna have a big party. So clean up that way, maybe, host a big party. So it forces you <laughs> to clean up that way. And just the, the clutter, you can clean it up. And in, then in your yard, let's, let's transfer that to not just things like yard tools or yard shoes or, you know, whatever it is you put there, um, whole rows of clogs or um, crocs from your whole family. Um, you know, but let's think about the plants as well. And something I want you to remember because we always, we wanna do, we wanna get it out in the yard and we are always thinking about adding more stuff. So this is a rule of thumb, um, even for cleaning out the clutter in your home. So let's take it outside too. Subtract before you add. There are plants out there, there could be plants out there that are dead. <coughs> and I just, um, did this at my church. I say I did it very literally. I have my husband do this because he was trimming trees anyway. And I told him um, before our sanctuary was remodeled and we moved back in, I didn't really have time to create a beautiful, wonderful garden yet. Um, but what I told my husband was take these dead shrubs out. It's going to look a million times better with the dead things gone. I mean, nothing looks better. No plants look better than dead plants. Let's just say it that way. And so, you know, that could also be something you're overlooking. And not just dead, but perhaps dying or poor performers. And this is where it gets emotional because um, we want, you know, we want to give these things a chance. But if you've been giving it a chance for five years, <laughs> it's probably not going to function well. If you, um, there's a saying that says the difference between a professional uh, landscaper and a home landscaper is the size of their compost pile. Professionals don't hold on to the, um, 
you know, an emotional attachment to the plants out there. Either they're performing well or they're not. But here, here's um, some, here's a compromise for you if you don't wanna, don't wanna rip them out and get rid of them. If they're not dead, they're just performing poorly. Treat them uh, like an employee and say, okay, we're gonna put you on a work plan. You're not working out over here. You're just not performing well. So what we're gonna do is relocate you over to this other department <laughs> or this other area in the yard. Maybe then you will be enacting right plant, right place. And maybe that plant will thrive there. So go ahead and give it a chance. But if it still refuses to do well, give it a chance to be an important part of the compost department. Also, you know, just get out there and weed. Um, this is a picture of, of one of the master gardeners um, that I used to work with at County Extension. She's passed on now too. Um, boy, she loved weeding. She was really, really, that was her thing. She'd get down on her knees. Her name was grandma. She was not my grandma. <laughs> she preferred to be called grandma. Um, and, you know, she just loved that weeding. Get down there. You, you'd be surprised how um, you can just really freshen up a plant bed by getting rid of dead things and weeding it. Also, while you're out there, um, get rid of the non-native invasive plants. That's something that won't cost you anything at all to start pulling out. I know skunk vine is gonna be impossible to eradicate completely, but maybe you can free your azalea bushes of it. You know, it's warmer than it should be right now, but it's not August heat. You're not going to, you know, die out there. So enjoy being out there in your t-shirts and shorts and just get rid of stuff, clean it up, get rid of stuff that shouldn't be out there. Another thing you can do is make a scene. <laughs> In your yard, um, this is where the fun part comes in. What I just told you didn't sound that fun, but here you can start getting creative and having fun and challenge yourself to not yet spend any money. Challenge yourself to look around and what you already possess and how you can arrange things to create um, these outdoor rooms and create scenes. This is where you, know, you, you can get creative look around for the fun decorative items that you already have. You may not even have thought of them as fun decorative items. You know, who thinks of a crock shoe here? <laughs> it's a fun decorative item, but Master Gardener Wynn certainly did. You know, he played up the purples there. Um, if you already have some furniture, you know, to put to use outside, this is a great time of year to spend it outside here in Florida. Um, less insects and certainly not as hot. Maybe these chairs here, you know, not worth sitting in, um, but paint them up, you know, put, put flower pots in them. Anything, anything out there can become um, part of your outdoor decor. Anything that you already have, um, maybe that some friends of yours are getting rid of, just, you know, look around and have fun and create those scenes in your yard, those fun scenes. Mulch, there's mulch all around us. You can purchase mulch um, or you can utilize what is already available to you. If, if you're really looking at a place to tighten up the budget, mulch might be a consideration for you. Grass clippings can make a nice mulch. I would warn you, especially with the grass clippings though, don't put them on too thick because, you know, that's what they make um, thatched roofs out of is grass, you know, <laughs> clippings because they do form mats very well. So you don't want um, grass clippings that are gonna form a mat and not allow water through. So just maybe an inch or so, and you can then put some uh, wood or woody type mulch on top of it. Pine needles, a lot of us have very, you know, accessible pine needles, either in our own yard or, you know, somewhere very close by. 
Um, I have plenty. I just bought the uh, lot next door to me. So it's all pine needles. And what's funny to me is um, pine needles are kind of the in thing right now. In um, I know someone whose mom has a pine plantation in Georgia. She makes way more money on those pine needles than the trees when it's time for the trees to come down. And because in Atlanta, they'll pay top dollar to have pine needle mulch. And so the funny part comes in is my husband, he's a native Floridian, kind of wrinkles up his nose at pine needle mulch because because it's free and available. And, you know, he thinks it's something that, uh, you know, you use if you don't have any money. Okay, yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that either. It will break down um, faster than some other mulches, but without, with any mulch, you still wanna be careful, only two to three inches that you wanna use uh, in your flower beds. Leaves, you know, um, that's, that's how it happens in the forest. These pine needles fall, or if you've got an oak forest, the oak leaves fall. You know, they are great, um, you know, great mulch for you to use. And pretty soon, all the live oaks, um, we call them live oaks, um, not because they keep the same leaves forever. <laughs> you know, no living thing does that. What happens is when the green leaf, the leaves don't fall off, until the green leaves come out. And when the green leaves come out, those all those brown um, live oak leaves come down like rain showers. Any of you who live around you know, live oaks know that. So that's a great time to rake them up and use them as mulch. Utility mulch, um, a lot of people do use it. I do have to caution you um, if you, you know, see them out trimming trees on the roadsides and you ask them for those chips, it's possible that they might give them to you. But remember their job. Their job is public safety. Um, they're either keeping the power lines safe or um, the roadways, sidewalks, you know, something like that. That's all that's on their mind. Open this space up. So therefore they don't care what kind of trees or what kind of vines are in them and it becomes a safety factor for them while they're cutting them, um, you know, that they're cutting up and um, chipping. Therefore there could be invasive exotic um, plant life in there. So you wanna be very, very careful about that. Also it's, you know, it's new, it is just chipped. You just got it from them. So I would let it sit a while. I made that mistake and burned out a whole, um, you know, front bed with a bunch of new shrubs in it. Um, they also, they can be good to use for driveways or walkways. Just keep an eye and be real careful though that you are not starting any kind of invasive exotic plants growing up from that. Also compost, you know, if you start a compost pile or get a compost bin, um, you can start using that compost as mulch as well. So there's lots of things you can do um, and places you can save money when mulch is involved. <coughs> of course, my mother had a whole lot of plant friends, <laughs> people that she um, traded plants with pass along plants, you know, make friends with your neighbors. Um, some plants are very easy to propagate and to share, but I want you to be careful. <laughs> Let's go back to what I just warned you about, about the mulch and invasive exotics. So um, the, many of us who still live in the area, well, I moved, so I don't have the problem now, but I did at an older house. And you know, our mother was one of those pass along plant people. And because of that, you know, my sisters and I and my other house fighting Boston ferns forever because our mother said, look at these, these are great. They just spread everywhere. So you want to be discerning, learn what is an invasive exotic. If your plant friend says, you can't kill this, it just grows everywhere. Consider that a red flag. 
and look that plant up. You can take it to the county extension office. You can take a picture of it and email me to make sure it is not an invasive exotic plant that is going to, or an invasive non-native, I'm sorry, UF, you know, and um, USDA changed the wording there, an invasive non-native plant um, that is gonna cause you more harm or cause the environment more harm. And of course, while you're out and about, it is so much better to find a problem when it's a small problem than to suddenly come across a very large problem in your yard. So go out there and scout for problems. 99.999% of the time, if I see a plant with a problem, like shriveled up leaves on a, on a branch, or I can see that there are some that actually looks like a sawfly on, on that picture. Some problem insects or whatever, you know what I do? How I fix it? I've got these little pruners. I prune it off, put it in a plastic bag, throw it away in my trash. That stuff doesn't go in the compost because you don't want to spread it along. And almost all of the time, that fixes the problem. No chemicals, no money spent, no harm to the environment. But you do have to be aware of what's going on in your yard. And I mentioned your pass along uh, plant friends. You can learn um, to propagate. It's usually really easy as you can see here. And um, there's some steps that they took to propagating these, these little plants. I'm not even sure you know, what they are, but um, some people use and purchase a um, root toner. You can do that, but you don't have to. Just get a good soil mix. You can even make that up from your compost pile and compost and some sand out there. A lot of people make their own um, soil mixes. And then you cut off you know, the little pieces as they're showing here. Put the stem in the soil. And then you cut off a whole lot of the leaf because you don't want it to you know, put a whole leaf big item in there. You want it to make it small, but you want to leave enough so it does photosynthesize. And usually then what's going to happen here is you're going to cover it with plastic wrap, even put it inside maybe a milk carton. Um, so you created your own little mini greenhouse. And many of these will take off their, um, these herbaceous plants. You can do that with. Woody plants are a little harder, but we do have classes on propagation. Um, I'm gonna to talk to Dr. Lester about maybe creating um, more of a hands-on workshop that then maybe we can record and make available to everyone. Um, but propagation is usually pretty easy and it's using the plants that you already have to create more plants for you. And pruning, as long as you already have, you know, the, the tools, that's something you can go out there. Um, right now, you can go ahead and prune any of your woody plants. Um, I would stay away from planting your really leafy, herbaceous kind of plants, because even though it's really warm right now, who says it's going to be warm three weeks from now? We might have a hard freeze. And when you prune those herbaceous plants, and pruning always encourages new growth. New growth is very susceptible to frosts and freezes. And in fact, you could bring the damage closer into the, the core of the plant. So stay away from pruning any of the leafy herbaceous plants, even if they look ugly. Now, I'm, when I said remove dead plants, I was referring to dead, 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 dead. <laughs> Not, um, frozen back. Frozen back, black, back plants, you're going to have to live with the ugly if we do get a freeze until at least March 15th. And then you can start pruning those back. But as far as woody plants, like this crepe myrtle, and I bring crepe myrtles into the mix for a reason, because pretty soon you're going, I can hear them right now. Can you hear them? You hear the chainsaws? People are out there 
hat racking um, and severely pruning the crepe myrtles all over the place. Um, <coughs> and they do that because they believe, well, they do it because everybody else does it, but it, it started because, you know, they think then they get that new growth every year, that really whippy like new growth and has bigger flowers, but it actually has less flowers. Um, and the bigger ones kind of make them droop more when they're wet. Also, eventually, you are shortening the life of your crepe myrtle by severely pruning them to where they look like, you know, they're just fists who want to fight you for, for doing that to them. Here's an example of um, what somebody did as an experiment. Jim Davis is the county extension director here in Hernando County. He had three crepe myrtles in his yard, so he decided I'm going to do an experiment one winter. Um, one, he left alone. He did nothing at all to it. The other one, he pruned like this one here, which has all that very thin twiggy growth taken out of it, the suckers removed from the bottom, and um, any crossing branches. You know, that looks like it's crossing, but it wasn't. I was there. It's mine. Um, and, you know, that's and left it to grow naturally. These can be so beautiful in the winter, even when they're naked. They have beautiful winter form if you don't keep hacking them down. Then the other one, he hat racked, he severely pruned and um, to run the experiment. What he found is what came back looking the best was the one that he moderately pruned. So I kind of ran a failed experiment because I didn't have enough controls. <laughs> he had the one great myrtle. This um, looks good there, but I think the following year, I, out of laziness or whatever, didn't prune it at all. And you don't have to if it's you know one of those really big tree-like ones. You really don't have to. But I wasn't happy with the look, and so then the following year, it caused me to over prune. <laughs> Not, not severely, but more than I was happy with. And it's not evened out. I'm gonna to have to fix that this year. And so I guess the moral of that story is every year, clean out the twiggy new growth, anything smaller than a pencil um, and you know, just do the nice cleanup on them. For any kind of young plants, you don't wanna remove more than 20%, whether that's a shrub or a tree or whatever, and established plants, you don't want to remove more than 33%, unless it's roses or something that you can cut down to the ground. But this same rule applies to these crepe myrtles as well. Compost, that's something you can do for free. Um, Hernando County even offers free compost bins to its um, residents, one, one per household. So, you know, just your, the trash that you cleaned up at the beginning, unless it is diseased or has an insect problem, best place for it in your compost pile. Your kitchen waste, um, any non-animal products, um, best place for it in your compost pile. There's one animal product you can use in your compost pile and that is eggshells. Those are purely um, calcium, and they're not really gonna ever break down. So you wanna break them up really, really, really small, but they do you know, leach calcium into your compost pile. So those are all things that you didn't even have to spend a dime and you moved forward a lot in just feeling good about what your yard's gonna look like. So now we did all that. Now let's, you know, it might be time to spend some money. So let's see how we can do that but still in a low cost um, manner. And the biggest way to do that, you know how they teach you um, in home economics and other places that you should plan your meals and then make a grocery list. You will save money if you do that rather than just going into the grocery store willy nilly and buying whatever and don't go hungry. <laughs> don't go to the store hungry. So, the same thing applies to your yard. 
plan before you plant. Um, <clears throat> they say, you know, um, what you should do is plan first, plant last. So first thing you need to know is our horticultural zone, and that is 9A. Florida Friendly Landscaping has so many different resources to help you. So there is um, a book, a physical book you can have in your hand for free, a Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Design. And actually, I'm, I haven't ever really pointed out very much that on, on those first few pages, in fact, I was just um, having a meeting with a friend of mine, we're gonna be doing class together next week. She never realized all those plans were in the front of that book or in, on pages 25 through 27 in that book, literally shows you how to make plans for your yard. Doesn't have to look like a landscape architect did it, as long as you can understand it. And if um, another great thing is this same information, the same book is available as a web tool you can have on your phone. They call it an app, but it's not, you don't really have to download it to your phone. But so then you can have it in the nursery and that way you put in, um, you know, whatever kind of beauty berry, whatever kind of plant you're looking for, and it gives you all the information on it. And speaking of being at the nursery, <coughs> the best economical thing, way to buy plants that I have found is to utilize the smaller local nurseries that are run by some type of organization, whether that be a garden club. Um, Native plant societies don't tend, as far as I know, at least not around here, they don't tend to have a full-time nursery, but they do have probably twice a year plant sales. You wanna look out for those. <clears throat> a lot of other plant clubs will do that as well. But our Hernando County uh, Volunteer Master Gardeners, they have a full-time nursery here in Hernando County. Here's the address, 19490 Oliver Street. Here in Brooksville, it's, it's um, by animal control. They are open, it's run totally by volunteers. So they are open Wednesdays and, and Saturdays, just two days, um, eight to noon, till probably April-ish, and then it'll be eight to 11. I'll say it's hot, um, but you know, I go there to get most of my plants because <clears throat> I trust them. And I know they're not 100% native. They have a lot of natives, but I know everything there is going to be Florida friendly. Um, you're not going to accidentally purchase some invasive non-natives. Um, maybe years ago they might have had some, but I know Dr. Lester cracked down on, you know, no, we're not going to sell this, this, and this. And they are very well trained by Dr. Lester and possibly by me <laughs> um, to have, you know, the best plants available. And when, wherever you are, whatever nursery that where you are, you want to look for healthy plants. And, and don't impulse buy, just like don't go to the grocery store without a plan. And while you're hungry, don't go to the nursery, not really knowing what you want. No, it's fun to say, oh, look at that. I want to get that. And you can treat yourself that way. But overall, have a plan when you walk in there, or you're going to end up with plants that you purchased because they were pretty and they're not going to work out for, you know, in your yard. You would not, um, I've said this before, you would not choose a life partner <laughs> just based on their looks alone. There's a lot of other things you're looking for, and you got to think of um, the plants that you bring into your landscape kind of the same way. I have a um, class specifically on that. If you go to Hernando County Government YouTube, you will find um, and go there and look for So You're at the Nursery and get in a lot more details about that. Another thing, all we are saying is give leaves a chance. Uh, so many of us talking about looking for pretty are focused on flowers, 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 when really the background of our yard should be green, you know, and leaves, you can, flowers are only around for a short period of time. 
the leaves are your mainstay. So don't be afraid of um, incorporating things that have big, bold um, leaves, interesting texture. Focus on those leaves because they're going to be representing your yard all of the time. Those beautiful azaleas I showed with my mom was, you know, a month, six weeks, something like that, if that long. So keep in mind, yeah, there'll be showcase times, but show some respect, show some love to the leaves who um, are there making your yard look good all of the time. And don't be afraid to bring in big, bold pieces with leaves. But speaking of <laughs> flowers, if you have a little area that you want to spend the time to change up, um, you know, to make, an annual area that you know you have fun with and you like to do that. I would restrict that to maybe a, you know a certain bed or um, certain containers that you have where you like to change them out with the seasons. But as far as the whole rest of your yard goes, perennial flowers are going to bring you perennial savings. You're not going to have to put them in that compost bin and start all over, you know, every season. Also think of um, the, your carbon footprint. If you buy annuals that you're replacing in large scale all the time, those annuals, you know, come from somewhere else, they're trucked here, it leaves a big carbon footprint. But these perennials, once you have them, they, um, Generally, you know, they'll be advertised as they're good for two to three years. We think perennial, they should be around forever. Maybe some will, but you can't, you know, always depend on that. But stagger your bloom times. This um, is a current master gardener. Um, she lives in a gated community here in Hernando, and she has uh, almost entirely native yard. Obviously her turf, which, you know, she doesn't have a choice. <laughs> she has to have some of that turf. And she has some fun like pintas here in uh, containers and things. Almost all of this is native, but you see how beautifully she's created the beds so that it is very attractive. And she has purposefully put things in that will bloom at different times. So there's always something blooming. Still need that green background to bring it all together, but it's fun too to plan to where, um, you know, when this show is over, the show is starting over here. And defining beds goes a long way towards helping your neighbors understand what you're trying to do, that it is a beautiful yard and not a patch full of weeds. It really does help. And as I just mentioned, um, Alice's yard here is almost entirely native. I would like you to consider alternative plants. That is, I put that capital in on purpose, alternative um, native plants. Um, they're gonna be easier to work with. They will attract a whole lot of pollinators and wildlife. They do attract more insects than non-native plants do. And therefore you're gonna attract more birds and all down the line. Once they're established, they can survive on natural rainfall. Once they're established, they need just as much water as anything else to get established. You wanna plant them in mass. A lot of people, they complain that they don't like about natives is they're too small, they don't stand out as much, which is not true. There are plenty of very large, you know, large plants that are native. But even for the small wildflowers and stuff, you'll have a much bigger, effect if you plant them a lot together in one place. That also will bring the butterflies, <laughs> they'll be more aware of it, as well as the other pollinators. To look for advice or where to find um, a lot of these native plants, because I know that is an issue, and you'll find a lot at uh, uh, Master Gardener Nursery. Also, like I said, look for um, our local native plant society will have usually twice a year plant sales 
um, at different places. But you can also look up this Florida Association of Native Nurseries, and they will have a list of native nurseries um, in our area, or you may have to take a day trip. But also, let me, let me warn you there, taking a day trip anywhere in Central Florida should be fine, have lunch, take friends, take your plant buddies. But you don't wanna to go to Miami or Tallahassee up and see Buddy up there um, for plants you wanna plant in Central Florida. Florida's big. Florida is a big state and it really is, you know, geographically different depending on where you are. It's horticulturally different. So if you're gonna take a day trip Groveland has a nice one. Um, there's several in Central Florida, kind of surrounding the Orlando area. Um, and that's fine, you know, stay within our 9A zone and Orlando, Orange County, all that they are. So that you bring the appropriate native, just because it says Florida native doesn't mean it's native to Central Florida. Or if you're in North Florida, you want to stay around there and the same with South Florida. You know the saying, um, <clears throat> go big or go home, which I've also seen a meme saying those who um, made that saying up have no idea how willing I am to go home, uh, <laughs> but I have changed it to go big and go home. When you're trying to fill in a space, don't be afraid. It's actually more cost efficient to, you know, get something bigger to go ahead and fill in that space not overly big, you gotta be careful because you don't, you gotta pay attention to the mature size that the plant is going to get. Um, but you also don't wanna start out itsy bitsy teeny tiny um, because that invites more weeds, other issues. Go ahead, don't be afraid to fill up a space, even if it's with a potted container and big leafy things, you know. Um, but see how nice, you know, this plan looks with the different um, shapes and how you fill that in. Now, why do I have here not for part-time residents? I am gonna reshare soon, because you're all getting here. Maybe I'll wait till next week when you're all coming down, the rest of you who didn't come before the holidays um, to share Florida-friendly gardening for the part-time gardener. And the reason I just say not for um, snowbirds is because it takes longer to establish. If you get yourself a you know, good medium sized tree, you're gonna have to be here longer than you can be here to really get that established. So you need to start with something young and really smalls and that, um, so you have the time to get it watered in and look after it and, <laughs> you know, safely go ahead and leave it. But for those of us who are around all the time in one location, then, you know, think about going a little bit bigger. Water savings, that's what I'm all about. Um, install a rain barrel. You knew I was gonna get to that eventually, didn't you? Also install a rain garden. What is that? We do have classes on that on Hernando County Government YouTube. It's basically a depressed garden. It's not sad, it's dug down <laughs> um, a little low. What you do is you go out when it's raining and find where's the water escaping my yard. And so what you wanna do is then stop it. So you create yourself a little mini drainage retention area like the county builds, but yours will be much smaller in scale and you're gonna fill it up with pretty plants. It's not a water garden, it's not a pond. It's, a, it's purpose is to stop the water before it leaves your yard and let it infiltrate into the ground. Um, like I said, we have classes specifically on that. Um, <clears throat> here's something that's not gonna cost you any money. It should be up in the no cost thing. Reroute downspouts to let the water soak into your yard. So many of us were taught to let it go down the driveway and down the street. And I think you're taught that by, you know, home builders who don't want it 
seeping into your home foundation or into your basement, which we do not have, but even into your home foundation. You can get it away from your house without sending it down the driveway and down the street, picking up every bit of pollution it can find before it gets into our, the nearest waterway. You can reroute it. We have very sandy soil. Don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> we can reroute it to one of our beds, even into our lawn. You can put one of those wide landing pads um, at the bottom of the downspout so that it does not rut and just let it or go into that rain garden. Um, just don't let it go down the street. And the more surfaces in your yard that are pervious, that allows water to go through, like walkways that are mulch or shell or even pavers or bricks, you know, patios, whatever lets the water seep through, um, the better. And you can save water not having to put your irrigation system on as much. <clears throat> what about pest control? And, you know, trying to save money with pest control. So Florida Friendly Landscaping always promotes spot treating only where you have a problem. Never ever do we recommend broadcast spraying your whole yard to kill off every living thing in there. Um, it's going to cost money and it's going to cost, it's a big cost on the environment. So wherever you have a problem, you just find the appropriate way of treating them with the appropriate product and the county extension office can absolutely help you with that. Also, I see all kinds of advertisements that different um, pest control companies are doing regarding mosquito control. We have a mosquito control department here in Hernando County. Every county in Florida does, they have to by law. Um, and if you're having a mosquito problem, give them a call. Here's their number where you can find yours in your county. That's 352-540-6552. Here, you will almost certainly talk to Karen uh, when she answers the phone and tell her I'm having this problem. I got these daytime biters or I have these nighttime biters and they'll send some guys out. They are not going to charge you. They're not going to fine you. They're not there to violate, you know, you know, to give you a ticket in any way. What they're there to do is find the problem. What's causing this problem? And it could even be, you know, maybe an empty lot next to you that has some tires or something you're doing that you weren't aware, you know, it just didn't occur to you. Maybe water built up in a, inside of an old dead tree or, you know, who knows? They'll help you, you know, find the problem and it won't cost you anything. If you have a pool that you can't take care of right now, or you have a pond in your yard that doesn't have moving water in it, um, or even an, a large animal trough for horses or cows or whatever, mosquito control will bring you for free these little um, mosquito fish. It won't cost you anything and they'll eat the mosquito larvae. Even in the animal troughs, the fish would act just like it was in a lake. If your horse goes down to drink, the fish will just get out of the way and go on the bottom. Um, won't make your pool beautiful and clear, but it will stop the mosquitoes from getting there if you, you know, don't have a pump on it right now or something. All those things are free. Um, if you do have insect issues, take a picture, email it to me. I'll send it to Dr. Lester or you can take some to the county extension office for ID. And of course, we, we did have classes on that as well on Hernando County Government YouTube. Look for climbing the IPM pyramid, exploring the steps of integrated pest management, and also look for reduce your chemical use. And I don't like this picture any more than you do, so let's move <laughs> the slide. Now, one of the last things I want to point out is to beware of false economy. Sometimes we think, you know, I'm doing this to save money, and it's not really a way to save money. 
Um, one of the ways is, um, and sometimes maybe you have to seed your lawn instead of sod. Um, if at all possible, I don't recommend that for several reasons, unless you're overseeding. Occasionally I will overseed my Bahia grass and weed <laughs> lawn with more Bahia grass. But let me tell you right now, it's expensive. I did it last summer and I only did that the front square right directly in front of my house because 10 pounds of seed was $70. I don't think sod, you know, if you have to resod is going to be a whole, you know, significantly higher in cost than seed. And what happens when you sod is then you fill in that space with the sod. Seeding, especially um, Bahia grass seed, well, number one, you can't, there's no seed for St. Augustine grass. If you have Floritan, seed doesn't exist for it. But if you are seeding, you know, your Bahia, that the seed is tough. Make sure you get seed that is scarified, scarified. It's been roughed up and scarred. So it, you know, will germinate eventually, but it takes a real long time. The birds might come and eat it. And definitely the weeds are going to encroach before those we, those seeds take hold. So I do use it for overseeding, but trying to create a whole lawn from seed is um, gonna be a waste of your money and from what I know. Now this time of year, and I know a lot of, because um, I've heard a lot of companies are telling people to use ryegrass, nothing wrong with that, just remember it's only gonna last through May. It is an annual ryegrass to keep your you know, lawn green through the winter if that's what you wanna do. It is by no means a pers uh, permanent solution. Um, another thing that is a false economy, oh, is buying damaged or sick plants. You know that cart with all the damaged and sick plants that are a couple of dollars that we all gravitate to? Just think about the, well, why do they look that way? And could you be bringing something home that will affect the rest of your plants that are healthy? So, and even the ones that aren't in the cart, you wanna look them over. Go back to that YouTube video of, so you're at the nursery and I, I'll tell you about how to look under the leaves and what you're looking for to make sure that you are starting out with a healthy plant. And look out for those quick fixes. Um, and that can be anything from, um, you know, bear patch, you know, you have these bear patches and you see on TV to put this, these hydrated seeds down or whatever. Only certain grasses are going to grow here in Florida. You can't just get seed from anywhere. I mean, it may grow, but it's not going to last. You can't do fescues, Kentucky bluegrass, anything you know, along that line, those are cool season grasses. We don't have much cool season. So you gotta know exactly what you're, you're putting down. Also along the lines of quick fixes and kind of goes into the social media advice is, you know, things they'll tell you about baking soda or vinegar or, you know, you probably won't hear any of us telling you that because um, it would be illegal because it would be, they're not labeled. They're not labeled as an herbicide or whatever it is you think you're going to use. Grits on ant, fire ants do not work. <laughs> don't even, they don't chew. It doesn't blow up in their bellies. They more like kind of like sop food up like from a, a sponge. Um, you may have annoyed them so that they move to a different location. But see, those kind of quick fixes don't work. You wanna look for research-based, scientific um, ways of doing things. And you'll find that from your county extension office. You'll find that from Florida Friendly Landscaping. You'll find it if you Google whatever, you know, your issue is fire ants, UF, the University of Florida, so that every publication they have on that topic will show up. I have a lot of fun reading or you know, the comments and some of the neighborhood social media 
groups. Some of the things they come up with, and I don't get in there and comment because that's just a rabbit hole. I don't even want to go down. <laughs> but some of the ideas, well, one, you know, you're asking all the people out there. One of them was, what do I do about sand spurs? And one of the advice was, well, sand spurs don't like a high pH. So you need to get some lime and cover your whole yard with lime. So the sand spurs don't come back. There's so many things to deconstruct <laughs> with that statement. Number one is Fernando County, Central Florida's main industry is limestone mining. We have plenty of lime in our soil. Okay, that's number one. And I tell people, if you get a soil test and it tells you you need to add lime, send me a copy of that soil test and I will eat a bug online if that happens. Um, and I've seen sand spurs growing marvelously on top of pure limestone. So if you're gonna get it high enough to where the sand spurs won't grow, I promise you nothing else is gonna be growing there either. So, you know, just be careful where you go. I have barber, barber advice down here because years ago when I did work at County Extension, the horticulture agent at that time was talking with someone and he said, well, my barber told me, la la la. And what he answered was, well, I won't tell your barber how to cut hair <laughs> and, you know, let's not take his advice on gardening. Social media can be very helpful. I mean, the Hernando County Master Gardeners have a, have a um, Facebook page. I have a Facebook page. County Extension has a Facebook page. Those are the kind of places, you know, maybe Native Plant Society, something like that, where you know there's research-based scientific answers coming your way. Not just the same people that you ask, when is this red light coming in? What school can my kid go to? Um, where's a good doctor? <laughs> you know, things like that. Stick with specifics if you're asking about lawn and landscape advice. Or you might end up, you know, spending money needlessly. <clears throat> you notice I did not um, talk very uh, specifically about lawns. And that's because I'm tired of lawn. No, no. <laughs> Oh no, um, I've covered it. So this, I wanted to go a different direction with saving money in the landscape for this. Now saving money while taking care of your lawn is certainly possible. And I've covered it in many, many, many talks of mine. But here's just some of them that you can go back if you were looking for specific lawn advice. Um, some of the classes I have on Hernando County government YouTube. If you are um, sick of your lawn, <laughs> diverse lawn areas, how to break away from monotonous monocultures. I also have caring for your lawn when it's hot and dry. Home turf advantage, home lawn management, the Florida friendly way. Um, I'm not sure what this Florida friendly landscaping, <laughs> what I mentioned right there, but living Florida friendly in a deed restricted community. All of these and many others of my classes will cover how much water your lawn needs, not as much as you think. Um, mowing it high, it's the only thing I'm gonna throw out to you because it's the most important, four inches, three and a half to four inches. If you're mowing lower than that, you are stressing an already stressed plant. But you can find that out in many, many of my classes. And I've mentioned before, you know, where's the place to go? Your neighborhood Facebook group is not the right answer. <laughs> um, County Extension, you can email Dr. Lester here in Hernando County, wlester at ufl.edu. Teresa is the Natural Resources Program Assistant, and she also serves as the phone answerer and the overall 
mother of the whole play. She makes everything run. So um, here's her email. You can give them a call at 352-754-4433 or stop by um, next to the post office at California Street and Spring Hill Drive. Um, or you can call or email me. And if I don't know the answer, I'll send it to Bill. I'll send it to this guy. This is, this is Bernie. He is one of the most knowledgeable master gardeners that I know. And as you can see here, he's dealing with a lawn sample. So if you're having problems with your lawn before spending any, before spending one more dime on it, take a sample of half good and half bad to Bernie on Thursdays between nine and four. So he can um, talk to you about what might be going on with your lawn and any other gardening questions as well. And here's some of the resources that I utilized. If you would like a copy of this P, uh, PDF copy of this presentation, please email me at Lily B, two L's in the middle, at hernandocounty.us and say, please send me a PDF copy of um, Budget Conscious Landscapes so you can have all this information in writing. And I'll be glad to send it to you. Here are the upcoming classes that I mentioned that we've got coming up. Um, so January 5th, I will not have an online class that day. In January, I'm gonna be branching out. We'll see, you know, if, if the higher ups say, no, you can't meet in person, then obviously I will not be able to meet in person. But we're trying in-person classes again we're not cutting out online, online classes. I'm not leaving you know, my online folks. Um, just gonna happen to try to do both. But January 5th, next week, I'll be up at um, the Chinsegat Conservation Center in North Brooksville, participating in a day long um, national bird celebration. I will have um, one hour of that from 11 to 12, I believe on birds taping. But don't worry if you can't go there because it's going to show up. <laughs> it's going to show up online. I'm going to reuse the heck out of that birdscaping <laughs> program and you'll have many opportunities to see it. Um, then on January 11th, Dr. Lester and I are going to pre-record what could go wrong with edible crops. I think we promised that for you. It's gonna be pre-recorded, so I don't know exactly when it'll be available up on Facebook, um, but 4 p.m.-ish. So maybe look for it on the 12th. I'm gonna start having in-person classes at the Spring Hill Branch Library again, um, once a month, and it'll be in the afternoon, 2.30. So on the 12th, if you wanna see me in person, um, you have to go to my Facebook page and look for the Eventbrite link because it is limited, the amount of people. We're only allowing 20 people and it's, it's a pretty big room. Protecting pollinators from the cold. I will probably come back and then um, pre-record that uh, so that it's gonna be available on Facebook as well. So don't worry if you can't go in person. The 19th, Dr. Lester online um, live will do diagnosing home problems in your, no, diagnosing <laughs> plant problems in your home landscape, part one. On the 25th, I will be holding an in-person uh, compost bin and rain barrel workshop at Hernando um, County Extension. You do have to sign up for that. Obviously you have to eat, well, you know, it has a, event bright link as well. And then I will email you to give you directions. Um, and then on the second, which is a Wednesday, Dr. Lester will be back with diagnosing problems in your home landscape, part two. What I want you to remember about the rain barrel workshop though, is that day is your last chance for a $50 rain barrel. Um, you know how things are across the world. I have plenty of rain barrels. I just got a shipment of 100 in, but they were not $50. They were $64. So 
on the 25th, if you want a uh, rain barrel, the compost bins are free, as I said, to Hernando County residents, one per household. If you want a rain barrel and you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities and have never gotten a rain barrel before, you will get a $25 credit on your water bill. So therefore the rain barrel will only be you know, 25 overall, but that's your last opportunity. After that, they're going to start being $64 with a $30 credit on your water bill. But there's one more before that. You do have two opportunities in January to take a rain barrel class. And this, is, this one's gonna be a lot of fun because it's gonna be a whole event held outside at um, Steve Fickett um, Preserve, Hammock, Steve Fickett Hammock Preserve. It's a nice outdoor area, part of, an, of our environmentally sensitive lands um, that the county owns. So you can get a free compost bin if you don't already have one. You can purchase a rain barrel for $50 still. Um, and then after the workshops, Mike Singer of Environmentally Sensitive Lands will take you, this is like a two mile loop um, through Bicket Hammock Preserve. January is a great time to do that. To find out more about that, there is no Eventbrite link, but you do have to email me so you can get appropriate information and I know you wanna come. Again, if you have any questions or wanna chat about anything, here is my email at lilyb at hernandocounty.us. Thank you very, very much um, for attending all of you. And thank you those who will watch online as well. Thank you and have a great day.